So welcome to the Data Exchange Podcast. Uh, Today we have Tara Kelly. She is a data editor at datajournalism.com, which is part of the European Journalism Center. Uh, And today's discussion, we have uh, our managing editor, Jen Webb, and she will lead today's episode. Take it away, Jen. Thank you, Ben, and welcome to the Data Exchange, Tara. Thanks so much for having me, Jen and Ben. (laughs) Um, let's let's start with something sort of broad. So what path did you take to end up in data journalism? And can you talk to our audience? Um, our audience is mostly made up of data scientists, data engineers and the like. Um, can you talk a little bit about what data journalism is and what its purpose is? Mm-hmm. Well, I started out actually in public affairs and then I moved into journalism probably 2007, 2008. Uh, freelancing and doing a bunch of internships. And uh, I worked, you know, Time Magazine, The Huffington Post, CNN. Uh, I freelanced uh, for the FT Weekend uh, magazine. And actually one of my first pieces was a data journalism piece. I just didn't realize it. Um, And this was 2008 when people weren't really, The Guardian was starting to do stuff. um, uh, But yeah, it was kind of new. And I, I, I did a piece looking at the number of female generals in NATO countries for instance. And then they asked to me to continue this column and it was called the information and it was right next to Tim Harford's column. So I was like super excited to do this. Uh, so I just did a bunch of stories on, you know, quirky data um, and, and looking at the, you know, the story behind this, you know, calling up the world bank and trying to get data from them. Uh, and so basically after that, I moved more into general news. Um, and then after that, probably 10 years of journalism, I got a bit tired and decided to do more training. And then I helped found an advocacy assembly and e-learning platform that trains journalists and activists around the Middle East. Um, And then we we started doing data journalism training. Um, And then I did a course at University College Dublin in data journalism in 2018. And from there, uh, I started to go to a lot of data journalism conferences and meet a lot of interesting people. And um, that's when I landed this uh, job at uh, European Journalism Center. Uh, and I'm the data editor for the datajournalism.com project, which is funded by Google News Initiative. And uh, it's just, yeah, been very exciting. We've launched a podcast on called Conversations with Data, uh, where we interview lots of data journalists and other experts in the field. And then we have lots of long reads on there where people can learn um, about you know data journalism and how to improve their skills, and we also have loads of handbooks and verification um, tools. So yeah, that's kind of how I got into it. <laughs> so uh, you mentioned the FT. I'm a long-term subscriber of the FT and the Economist, actually. So Tara, so would you say that uh, so the business press they always have these pieces with charts and data, right? So do you think that do you think that was the early manifestation of data journalism was from the business press? Um, I think it actually started uh, in 1952 uh, when CBS network in the United States tried to use experts, um, you know, with a mainframe computer to predict the outcome of a presidential election. Now they didn't actually use the data in the end, but um, that was sort of the start of it. And then later on, you know, in 1967, that was when we saw more of that. And it, it, the person who was really the father of data journalism is Philip Mayer, who was at the Detroit Free Press. And he used a mainframe to analyze a survey of Detroit residents for the purpose of understanding and explaining the serious riots that were happening in, in that city that summer. Um, and then decades later, you know, The Guardian kind of picked it up and started doing the Guardian data blog. And that really was when stuff started to take off. But of course, business journalists have been using charts and graphs for decades, right? I mean, that's not anything new, but it's more about the analysis and the explainer pieces and these very cool interactive pieces we're seeing using tools like D3 or Tableau even, or um, data wrapper, which is something that much more sim- like a very simple tool I'm sure you guys have heard of. So yeah, so data journalism is kind of a mix of data visualizations or timelines or maps 
um, so even vaccine trackers. But I think that you know the Economist and the Financial Times are definitely leading um, with with the latest um, information on COVID, and and they've been they've done an incredible job. I would say their data teams. Um, yeah, they're, they're just brilliant and they've really kept people informed. Uh, so it's been a valuable, re those two publications have been valuable resources for us in Europe, I find, but also the world. So without, uh, let me ask you this. So if, if uh, I don't have an interactive chart that uh, um, it would be easier for me to, 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 publish something, but that also, uh, that also means it maybe it's less compelling. So uh, how important are interactive charts to uh, this field? Uh, yeah, that's interesting. I mean, I think they're kind of seen as the very shiny, cool things to be doing now. Like the New York Times has done some amazing stuff, the Washington Post, um, uh, ProPublica, but I don't think you necessarily need to, to you know, have that to do like a basic chart that's not going to update is still data journalism. And that is still very valuable to your audience. And sometimes these interactives look so cool. And we get so carried away. The reader doesn't always interpret what's happening. So that's, <laughs> yeah. that's the thing to think sometimes about. they're too clever, right? They're more yeah. of a distraction. Yeah. And, and I, I lean towards more of the simple side of things, but I also am hugely impressed with what a lot of these data teams, you'll have a developer, you'll have a designer, and they both could kind of do a bit of each other's jobs. And then you'll have a data storyteller who knows maybe a little bit about design and they all work together. And um, obviously these teams are hugely expensive to run, but they've proved to be valuable during COVID where we've needed more interactive stories to explain things. Um, Harry Stevens' piece from the Washington Post comes to mind, looking at how social distancing impacts the spread of a virus. Um, and that was the most viewed story on the Washington Post website ever. I mean, everyone from Nicholas Maduro to Shakira was like, talking about that piece on social media, state television. Obama was tweeting about it. I mean, this, so the impact um, can be quite great if you get it right and you don't make it all about the visualization. You also bring the story in and, and make sure that people understand what all these moving dots mean. Oh, if it goes quicker, we can see that social distance, social distancing is not happening. If it goes slower, oh, wow, the virus isn't spreading that much. So you really need to think about what, what the story is first and then bring in the visualization side of it. Um, yesterday, we did a live podcast with um, for my for conversations with data with this journalist called Ava Constanteras who does a lot of data training. And she was saying, she gave this brilliant analogy. She said, oh, I get a lot of journalists starting out with data and they, they want to, you know, they wanted to create this amazing visualization. But she said, I try to tell them, it's kind of like you're building a house and you want to pick out the color right now. She goes, but you, what you really need to bear in mind is you need to build the house first. I'm worried about your house falling down. First build the house, then you can pick your colors and your design. And I thought that was like a really good analogy to get people realizing that data viz is not the first thing you should be thinking about. It's where's the data set from, you know, and, and what story can we tell here? You've talked a little bit um, about the tools that you've used. Can you dive a little deeper into that? that so um, tools, sources, methods um, that you use to gather and assemble data. Um, and then you also do some um, training, I think, on best uh, practices. So if you could share some of that too in sort of the context of those things. Yeah, sure. So some of the tools that come to mind, I mean, most journalists, they start out right with spreadsheets. I mean, Excel and Google Sheets are kind of the go-to tools for just, you know, you, you find your data set, you download it, you're, you're bringing it into these sheets and you start cleaning. Um, if, if it's something simple, you can easily use spreadsheets for that. You don't need coding, right? But if you want to scrape stuff, Google Sheets is a very easy way to do that without knowing any code. Um, and, you know, an easy Google search can teach you how to, how to do that. Um, in terms of cleaning data, there's some tools like OpenRefine 
that are quite good. That works if you've got a lot of data and you know you want to be more efficient about it. I think feel like a lot of journalists find that they spend data journalists they spend most of their time cleaning the data and just getting. I think it. that's the same with the data scientists too. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. So, uh, and, and then the other tools, I'd say, um, if 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 the data set is too big for uh, Excel, then it's always best to have like our programming to rely on that. That's what I use. Other people use Python, but I find R is what I learned and it makes sense, even though it looks like it's something from the 1970s, <laughs> the, the, the interface of it. But I, I feel like that's a really good way to sort of analyze, pull up the data, see where your highs and lows are, your minimums and maximums, your, you know, just trying to look and see what the, where the outliers are, because often those outliers are really going to help you tell the story that you didn't necessarily think about. So, um, and then, you know, um, of course, when it comes to visualization tools, like Data Wrapper is great because it's, um, it was actually developed for journalists. Um, and it, it's just a very easy tool. You could even just upload your Google sheet and then boom, you could create a bar chart, you know, something very simple. Um, you could do a map, uh, you know, you could do a lot of different, there's, I don't know, there's something like 20 different um, uh, possibilities with that. And it's super quick and it's really great for journalists who are on a deadline and they just want to create something simple and, it, and get that out there. Of course, there's Tableau, which I'm sure every data scientist listening knows what Tableau is. I won't go into that, but a lot of journalists really rely on uh, Tableau and Tableau Public. Um, in terms of sources, I mean, I'm in Ireland. So if I'm doing an Irish a story around Ireland, something around the Irish central statistics office, they will have information for me nationally. Um, the World Bank, the European Union Open Data Portal, the World Health Organization, data.gov, the US census, other censuses around the world. Um, you know, there's thousands of databases as well that kind of focus on different topics that are more niche, but I tend to do more general, broad global stories, comparative stories. So that, um, you know, that, that's basically what I focus on. Um, in terms of best, best practices, I guess the thing that I could point everyone to is our website, datajournalism.com, where we have, you know, hundreds, or not, well, we have many pages of information. Like for instance, we have three different handbooks uh, on the site right now, looking at disinformation and verifying information online. Um, we have our original data journalism handbook. The most recent data journalism handbook just came out um, with like, I think 50 different authors contributing and kind of showing the landscape around the world with data journalism. So it's always good to go to those sources for best practices, but our long reads also help. Like for instance, we just wrote a piece on how to build a data hypothesis as a data journalist. You know, we can make a lot of assumptions about data for instance, everyone kind of knows that it's widely accepted corruption and uh, procurement processes, particularly around COVID, are quite common. There's there's a lot of local local corruption happening. But if you you have to sort of ask yourself what story a data set is telling you, and what what data can you actually get, and and try and frame it based on the facts you have in front of you, not what you wish a story to be, so to speak. So I think that that's just one, one piece that we've done. We have another one coming up on Excel and uh, dy dynamic array functions and the efficiency of that and what journalists need to know. So that should be pretty useful. We've got another one coming up on drone journalism. Um, so using drone data and what are the pitfalls and implications of that um, in Europe and the United States, we're specifically looking at that. So those are just some pieces uh, to guide you. And By I, the I way, uh, you may, as you were talking, it just struck me. So the data scientists are great at data science, but maybe don't, uh, are not as proficient in storytelling, whereas the journalists are great at storytelling, and now they're getting into data science, right? Which is a great kind of... Uh, uh, meeting, melding of the mind somehow. So I have a, a couple of quick questions. One is, uh, what is the state of jour data journalism in a typical modern newsroom? So in other words, uh, is that now a must-have? Is that a, 
is that a well-known function or, or, uh, or do you still have to explain it to the old school uh, editors? And then, um, yeah, let's start there. I think it depends on what newsroom, but I'd say in the UK and mo most of Europe and, and, and many big news organizations in the United States have a data team. And, um, you know, I'm just trying to think here. Sometimes so, so the day, is, the data, is the data team data scientists or journalists who, or data journalists? I think what used to happen was they'd hire a data scientist and a couple of developers and a couple of designers, and they would all try and work together. But now what's happened is I think people have, journalists have learned a bit of coding. The designers have learned a bit of coding and storytelling. The developers have learned a bit of design and coding and maybe the storytelling side, and they're all working together. So we're seeing that more and more. I know the Guardian operates like that, the Telegraph as well. Some news organizations are more, where, where they have maybe that old school mentality, they have like a specialist that comes to the to the data desk and they see it as like a serve, like, like you go to the library and you get a researcher to help you dig out stuff. And, and that doesn't work so well because then sometimes that person, that reporter who did all that digging, it doesn't get a byline, but the one who wrote it does. So we're moving away from that thankfully, but it still does exist in the United States and Europe, that kind of help desk mentality. And that isn't the best way to do it. The best way to do it is to have a mix of all these skills together and, and working together where, and, and coming up with the story and, and learning a bit of this and a bit of that. But yeah, you do, you do have your one specialty, you know, as well. Yeah. And as so you mentioned, you, uh, go ahead, Ben. <laughs> as, you, as you mentioned, the top brands are, are well situated. Like I actually know the chief scientists at the New York Times, so they have a a big team. And then I think like even the local paper here, San Francisco Chronicle might have a few data journalists. So it's starting to happen, I think. Um, so my, my other question was, you've mentioned a lot of data and data types, but one thing that uh, uh, I would imagine that you guys probably must start uh, thinking about these days is uh, text, right? Unstructured text. Right. Um because really you, you, you folks have tons of data on microfilm, right? <laughs> yeah, exactly. Um, I can't really speak to that, so I'm not really able to... No, no, but you. have you seen, is this like a new trend? Is this an emerging trend in data journalism? Let's also analyze text. It is. Um, I, I haven't really seen much of that right now. Um, I feel like everyone is kind of really focusing on... COVID at the moment. Okay. Um, and I, I think that there is, there are some pieces like where people are looking at, for instance, like scripts, like how, what, how many women were saying X, Y, or Z, or how right. many, right. how many different minorities were involved. So, so like transcripts from videos. And, yeah. And yeah. so we're seeing a little bit of that and there's some automated tools out there, but I, I can't, I can't remember exactly the names of them, but I have seen that that is becoming a thing. I think that's probably like a new frontier that will open up soon. Right. Yeah. And in speeches as well, how many times you said this and uh, yeah, that, that is becoming something I think, but I, I can't really comment much on that. <laughs> probably pop culture will push that forward. Maybe. <laughs> so are you finding that sources are in the, the, like are sources becoming more forthcoming or less forthcoming with their data? Or are you having to file, like, I don't know, is there in Europe, is there a, like a, a Freedom of Information Act equivalent? Um, and also, like when you're doing US stuff, can you, can a foreigner file a Freedom of Information Act? That's. I want to say I'm not entirely sure about that. I don't believe, it depends on country. So um, yeah, basically to answer your first question, each country kind of has their own Freedom of Information Act. And Many countries um, require you to be, uh, you know, a citizen, or sure. sometimes even a resident of that country. So, um, take Iran for instance. You definitely have to be a citizen, and you have to give your ID, <laughs> and it's not a fun process, right? Who's going right. to go want to request that? Um, yeah. But there is right. a project called the Iran Open Data that kind of cleans data and finds it from government sources and makes it available. So there are ways around it, but yeah, the open data world is kind of 
There is, yeah, it's becoming like in the UK, I've definitely noticed that there is less, that the data is becoming less open and it's requiring people to do more freedom uh, of information requests. And what we're seeing as well across Europe is a rise in cross-border reporting because mm -hmm. of this, because you have to be a resident or you have to be a citizen. And you, what, you're, what you're trying to do is then work with people who are in those countries on, on that actual story. And then you publish it in all these different languages, but maybe you do it in a different way. Maybe the headline is different because that culture re responds differently to, to what the main story is. And so we're seeing a rise in that. And part of that is because of the difficulty in getting information if you're not a citizen. So I think that that's an interesting trend, the cross-border reporting. So, so there's yeah. probably not a fixed workflow for data journalism, but uh, so would you say it's typically, I have a story idea, let's find data or, oh, I found some data, here's the story. What's, what's the useful flow? I'd say it's both. I mean, it, it depends. Like if you're in a newsroom and you're, you know, there's a major breaking story and you want to look at, say there's a new law coming out on immigration and you really want to dig in and see, okay, how many countries are taking people's passports away and, and removing citizenship? So then you could do a story on that because you think that's my peg. I got to go hunt for the data. I got to go and analyze it. Boom. But equally, say you're doing that story and then you come across another piece of information that might be useful. You might, you might stumble upon something while you're looking at a data set and say, oh, that's my next story. So, or you could just be very curious about a topic and go and explore and go into the World Bank data set and see what, you know, what's going on here. Um, so this yes. is where what you mentioned earlier, where if you have more of a theme setting as opposed to kind of the centralized well, let's go to the data people, you yeah, know, yeah. Uh, where, so he, so the ideal scenario is the data people are actually in the team, right? Yeah, I think what's happening is we're seeing now people are specialized in a certain beat and then they're also a data journalist. Like they're a data journalist with a specialization in immigration or they're a data journalist with a specialization in health and pharmaceuticals. Um, so we're seeing more of that and less the general news reporter who kind of is dipping into lots of different stuff I think it's good to have both. It's good to have a journalist who is trained in a specific beat and knows that topic because then they can work together with the more generalized data journalist who maybe has some coding skills that they don't have. And, but then you're not, you're not making misleading statements or kind of jumping off topic in an area that you aren't familiar with. So that's very important to understand the context and work with someone maybe who has that specialty if you don't. So it's, it's really, it depends on the newsroom. Um, and it's, it's also very fast changing. Like this, everyone, like at, at some point we all want data journalism to no longer have the title data journalism. We want people to be trained and data literate <laughs> in the newsroom right. because journalists need that skill. And it's very important. I mean, COVID was a huge reminder of that. Uh, we, we all need to understand this basic, you know, data and how it operates and, and what, what conclusions you can and cannot jump to with, with a data set. It's all, it's really important to interview the data. So there, Jen, I have a question for sure. Go ahead. So, uh, so during the Trump years, so uh -oh. I think, uh, not that I have, you know, well, I am partisan, right? So, but anyway, so during the Trump years, it seems like, and correct me if I'm wrong, Jen, but uh, the most, High profile, most trafficked uh, media people during that era were the ones who had sources and were connected. They weren't data driven necessarily, right? So I'm talking, I'm thinking about Maggie Haberman and folks like her, right? So, so it seems like uh, uh, sources still high, might drive a lot of eyeballs. I suppose data. I think data. Data journalism is just hard. It's it's hard to crank out pieces, right? I mean, uh, and it's not gossipy. It doesn't have the headline necessarily, right? So, uh, well, and sometimes it, 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 I mean, five thirty eight's making a, a a buck or two on the gossipy side of that's data. That's true. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> but to the extent that media is a business, it seems like so. What what is the 
is there a is there a clear business model for data journalism in these uh, media organizations, or is data journalism considered a an expensive cost center? Uh, I'd say both. <laughs> no, I mean, I mean, one way journalists get around this: an organization like the Pudding, for instance, they are mainly data journalists, designers, engineers writing these amazing stories, but they have one side that's their editorial and then the other side that's their um, business side and their, their studio where they work with brands. And that's one way they can tell amazing stories on their editorial side, but then also they pay for that and they pay their people pretty well uh, for a journalist. Uh, you know, it's on their website. I think they make like over $104,000. Most journalists do not make that kind of money, uh, but they're highly skilled too. They're, they're engineers, they're designers, they're writers, they're everything. So there's a way to make it work. And I think they do see it as a competitive advantage, like especially when there's like award season or Pulitzer season. And, and you know, that's kind of the selling point um, and and the brand it strengthens the brand, but yeah, it is expensive because you're hiring, you're having to pay developers, data scientists, journalists who can write code, design. Uh, so it's 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 expensive, but I think as it as the skill set kind of spreads across the newsroom, and and that's important for editors to also build their skills. It, it could change. It could not be so expensive. Um, so that that's kind of. Yeah, I, I, I don't think there's a business model for journalism, never mind data journalism, though, I'll say that, I mean, which is another podcast we could get into, because we're not going to pay for news, we're not going to get, we're not going to be able to protect democracy, right? We're right, not going to be right. able to, so that's my European Journalism Center spiel right there. Well, uh, well, here, the subscription model seems to be thriving here as well, yeah. Yeah, yeah, we, we need to go that route, we need to bring people in and make them feel like tell stories that no one else is telling. And yeah, it may take some time to churn out or, or to design a data story, but the power of it and the impact can actually save lives as we've seen with COVID. I mean, if these data trackers and if, if the journalists can explain what is happening in those charts and, and change someone's behavior and make them understand that this is a, a lethal virus that you need to take seriously or you need to get vaccinated, that can really help. So we're, there's a power there that I think COVID has been, the silver lining of COVID has meant data journalism has played a key role in people understanding more about the pandemic. I have a story idea. Oh. Let's, uh, <laughs> let's track the, the penetration of data journalism in different areas of the U.S. <laughs> yes. If, if it correlates with the voting patterns, right? So. That's a good point too. Yeah. <laughs> so our, there's a lot of discussion about um, this. Is not related to what Ben was just talking about. <laughs> well, it is a little bit related, but I'll admit that. But um, there's a big discussion about ethics in um, the data science area right now, uh, with you know AI and the machine learning stuff and all of that going on. What? How does ethics play in to what you do? Um, is there a guideline for like the, for what data you can use, data that maybe you shouldn't use or how to use it, that kind of thing? Bias and all of that, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Um, right. Yeah, I think that there definitely is like, for instance, I, I, like I said before, it's really important to think about where this data set came from, how the data was collected. Can you talk to the person who put it together? Can you get on the phone and interview an economist who was, was responsible for this line of work? And, and can you understand what this means and what it doesn't mean? And also it's really important to look at what is the missing data? Um, some journalists are now even visualizing the metadata or the missing data to show mm -hmm. what this really means and express that uncertainty. So I think journalists have to be able to show that uncertainty and show what it does not represent as well as what it does represent. And so it goes back to this old phrase of, of interviewing the data. Like as a journalist, you wouldn't publish a story without interviewing your source. So you have to go and find and explore this. And if you if it's not your specialty, talk to another reporter or another editor and, and say, does this make sense? Am I making a leap here? What, what do you think? Um, so I think that those are really important, especially now considering how, you know, important it is to be publishing stuff that's accurate and 
verify your facts. Um, I'd say one of the a, a best practice that a lot of journalists use with the methodology side of it is to have a data diary. So each day when you work on something you're writing and you're taking copious notes, links, you're showing exactly what you worked on. And then later on, when you have to compose a methodology that should go at the bottom of your piece, it explains exactly how you did it, how you got it, and it's reproducible. And that should allow another journalist to be able to go in or a fact checker even before you publish it or an editor to see, this is how I came to this conclusion. This is not just me, you know, slapdash. Oh, I forgot to include that other, you know, it, it's, it's really important. So I think the data diaries and the methodologies are, and not a lot of journalists do do the methodologies because they're quite time consuming and you're on deadline. But if you're working on a really big piece and you know the impact is going to be great and you, you really need to be putting in those methodologies so people can understand how you got there. And that is a part of trust in journalism, transparency. It's not just about, you know, being a good, you know, data journalist. It's also like your audience, they want to understand this too now. Right. So it's interesting in, that, oh, go ahead, Ben. Oh, no, no, I'm just going to follow up on what you folks were talking about, which is in, in uh, the enterprise now, uh, data science and ML teams are starting to uh, build tools around ML ops, which basically maps out the ML life cycle, the machine learning life cycle. So they have mm -hmm. data quality checks, model validation, model testing, and so on and so forth. And then they deploy. Um, so what is a lot the of those work pipelines have the human in the loop too, which is yeah, what yeah, you're yeah, yeah. About. So, yeah. so, but they have uh, it's relatively new, but now you're starting to see products where the stages of this uh, governance and validation is well documented. So, so in the in the journalism world, there's a well established workflow around fact checking and ed an editor and sourcing and so on and so forth. So. Uh, what is data journalism? What is the workflow for d data journalism uh, today? Uh, in, 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 in particular, how do you prevent uh, the data journalism version of Stephen Glass and Jason Blair? Um, <laughs> huh, okay. I mean, I can talk to, I mean, it really depends on, on the newsroom and what you're focusing on, but I would say it starts, you know, in an editorial meeting, you have an idea, you think you have a data set, you pitch it, you, um, you go about, you dig through the data, you don't automatically assume that you have a story around X, but you're, you're looking for what, what is the reality of that data. But, and where but, the uh, are. but let's say I'm Jason Blair, right? So I... I pitch you, and then I basically may not be behaving ethically. Are there natural checks? Yeah, fact checkers will go in and say, "Okay, where's your data diary? Where's your logic? Uh, show me the show." Like I've I've had that at the FT. Like they were said to me, "Send me the data set. I want to see it with my own eyes." And and you know, are you? Where did you get this? And I had to because I had to come up with all the data from all these different sources. I had to right. send her like ten files, but they that's did right. check but on you it. Can, you can actually fake. You can send someone fake data, right? You so, could. but but, you but, but if you but if you document, but if they ask you to document it carefully, it'll be harder to fake it, right? Well, I mean, often they want to see the links yeah. where, on yeah, yeah, the World exactly. Bank. Uh, you know, exactly. where the, so I would send a link and I would also send uh, the actual data set. And so they could actually go right. through it themselves. It depends on how good the fact checker is. I used to be a fact checker, but I would go and dig and, and really yeah. be a pain in the neck about it because it's your, you know, I don't want to say it's your ass on the line, but it is like, it's, it's, you're going to get in big trouble if you get that wrong. And so people will, they'll, they'll be really tough on you, these fact checkers. Um, I, I think things have slightly changed in the fast paced nature of things, but you know, I, I think, I think it is important to not, I think a lot of journalists do, they, they want to do the right thing and they want to tell the story. Of course, there are other rogue characters out there, but I think there is this sense of you're in it because you want to be, you want to be 
telling stories that no one else is telling, you know, and, and you want that to be truthful. That's part of the whole thing. So yeah, of course you can't control for everything, but you need to do your due diligence. And that's why linking to stuff in that methodology and showing exactly where you got that data is really important. So considering a, a journalist who's in the pursuit of truth and looking to, to do a, a, an honest story, uh, what are some of the um, things that they should look out for, like to, to avoid um, having an error or a misleading story? Or so are there, are there issues of bias that play into that or um, maybe um, faulty data sources that look legitimate enough um, or wrong data that they could get, you know, if somebody makes an error in their data at the World Bank, then, you know, that's not the fault of the journalist. But like, what are some of the, the little pitfalls that, that you yeah. have to watch out for? I actually did find an error in some data. I think it was, I don't know if it was, it might've been the World Bank. And um, it was around, I was looking at sort of who studies abroad um, and, it, and it showed Angola had like, I don't know, 30,000 people studied abroad in Angola in 2015. And I was just like, 30,000 people what? in Angola? It didn't sound right, right? And I was like, but this is gonna be an amazing story. And as much as I wanted to run for that, I did email them and I said, hey, I saw this in your data set. Is, is this accurate? Because if it is, this is like the best, like the, for my piece I wanted to do, I'm looking at different countries and who, what countries have the most and highest. This is like an outlier. What, what's going on here? Like, I did not expect this. And unfortunately uh, for me, but I guess it, it was only about maybe 300 people who oh, were studying yeah. abroad. So, you know, you, you need to, and they corrected it and they said, thank you. And so those things, you, you need to not run off and get carried away. And you need to really sit down and say to myself, is, is that really, look how many people are actually at the university here. There's like maybe 5,000. It's probably not the case. So, you know, I, I, maybe it wouldn't have been my fault, but it, it, it would be irresponsible to run with that and not investigate further. So I think it right. is a journalist to sort of ask those questions. Like I was saying, find out, you know, where stuff is coming from. Um, I think a lot of the time, a, a really good way to, to, check those biases is, um, you know, to talk to other people maybe who don't have the same political views as you and run stuff by you, by them. So you can make sure that you're not really going overboard here. Um, because yeah, we do tend to lean left as journalists. So it, if you do have an aunt who's a Republican or someone who's more conservative in Europe, bring them up and ask them, you know, get, talk to other people and don't just be in your little silo and think you're going to have this amazing story. Uh, because sometimes, and this is also why it's really good to talk to someone who's actually specializing in that beat because they may know an expert who can explain why this crazy number is there or why there's missing data there. So um, there's a lot of data that's being reported by governments that doesn't actually make it out in, into these portals because it's so political with the UN. So I think that's another downside. <laughs> um, right. And, and also in Ireland, for instance, they don't publish a lot of data here um, because towns can have like 10 people in there or, or 100 people in them and they can figure out who those 10 people are. Or it's, it's, it's a privacy issue, a GDPR issue. So yeah, it's, it's really annoying. The missing data is very annoying, especially if you know the governments are collecting it. But sometimes phoning up the CSO, the Central Statistics Office here and saying, hey, do you guys have that data? They might kind of be like, all right, we can give it to you, but what do you need it for? And, uh, and so you can do a negotiation, so to speak, um, and try and get that data. But I'd say that that is probably the biggest challenge is not having the data. But as a data journalist, you've got to work with what you do have in the country that you are reporting on. And, and make that work. And maybe it's not there in, the, in that country's data, but they've given it to the EU. So you can go into the EU data portal and find it. So there, there are ways around it um, if you don't Wait, want to so do an FOI request. There, the, some of the most inspiring data journalism pieces I've seen are tied to uh, investigative journalism. So it the ones that take months. I'm thinking, actually, I saw, I might've seen a documentary about the opioid crisis in the US and 
there were data journalists in this documentary and they were they were like hand assembling this data set over month long periods of time but uh, it seems to me there's a certain amount of relentlessness needed for this line of work as well right oh absolutely and i think for those journalists that have to build the data set themselves particularly investigative journalists and their lives are on the line yeah it's a very you know uh you know in a way, I mean, it could be even be seen as a form of activism because they're so devoted to it, you know, and they are risking their lives, but it's not, it's separate. And I, I think, yeah, there's, you have to be very devoted and it's, it's a very tiring, arduous um, field to be in. Uh, having said that, if you're really devoted to the cause and that's what you want to do, you do it. And that's why I think some tools can help speed up the process of cleaning data like Open Refine or you know, Trent, which uses machine learning to trend, upload your transcriptions and transcribe them for you. So we, we need to use those kind of tools um, to speed things up and make our lives a little easier. Um, there's all these rumors, oh, is the, the robot's going to take over journalism? But I don't, there is a lot that these tools can do, but I don't see it completely taking over journalism. I just see it minimizing the amount of legwork that we have to do. For instance, Bloomberg, um, for instance, you probably heard this, they can use Python to actually create uh, company reports, automate those because they're quite dull to write and repetitive. Right. Right, right. And so you could go ahead and do that. Um, there's other examples too out there. And a lot of investigative journalists who are using data can work with developers to create tools that can identify certain keywords in a big data set. So then they can go in and analyze that and, and drill down into that investigation. Um, I think ICFJ and OCCRP, um, I don't know the details on that, but I know that that is something that they do do. They work with developers to sort of dig and find the details that they need in that data. And I think that's really a, a, an amazing way to save time, but also automate a lot of the hard labor. Um, of course, you still need to check and make sure things are correct, um, which can take time, but it, yeah. Process automation, Jen. That's right. Well, I was just, it reminds me of uh, narrative science some years yeah, ago. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, Chris, uh, they, Chris Hammond. Was, yeah. Yeah, there, there were, uh, you know, big discussions about AI taking over newsrooms because narrative science was coming in and they would do like, you know, your local soccer team's uh, score. Like people in small communities really like to see their kids in the paper kind of thing. So there's always like a section on high school games or, you know, little league or whatever. And, you know, the, taking a, a human being and having them sit down and actually write that is almost a waste of, you know, journalism, really. I mean, it's and having narrative science tools come in and, and automate the story and then having an editor skim it for, you know, accuracy. And then, um, and then they realized, as Tara pointed out, there's no money in that. So then right. they then they pivoted to to enterprise. <laughs> right, right. So look, I want to talk to you before I because we're running, starting to run out of time, and I don't want to skip this. Um, what like how there's a huge there. Most data journalists are um, in the pursuit of truth. There is a band of people calling themselves journalists who are in the pursuit of politics and political agendas. So there's a lot of misinformation going out that um, looks like it has a source that people, you know, read and believe. And so how is that, the misinformation that's going on, two, two things, how is it changing data journalism or is it? And secondly, how do we battle that? Yeah. Just, you know, I, I, I'm not expecting you to have like a big concrete plan, but, you know, like how to, from your perspective, like how, how do we go about battling that? Yeah, I think, yeah, it's definitely a major problem and it's definitely changing journalism, I would say, and it, it has severe consequences. I, I think there was a recent study looking at, um, you know, the United States Americans are more prone to believing this information or disinformation um, than other nationalities. And I, I think a lot of that in the United States has to do with the news landscape being so politicized and it's very dangerous uh, 
because it's become very tribal, much like the Middle East, ironically. Instead of religion, we have, are you a Republican? Are you a Democrat? You know, and so uh, it's, it's very scary. So what needs to happen is, okay, social media is rife and filled with misinformation. They are doing their best organizations like Facebook to combat this. They're funding lots of journalism programs. They're paying for a lot of fact-checking and debunkery but that's not looking at the systemic problem. It's just doing little piecemeals of it. So I don't know if that's the way forward. Um, I, I do like to see organizations like Facebook and Google giving money to journalists and trying to rectify this problem because it's a societal problem. If it wasn't happening on Facebook, it would be happening on somewhere else. But the spread of it is so viral that it, it has huge consequences like vaccination rates, you know, not being so high in the United States. Um, and, and I think that that's a major problem. So. I think you know these platforms need to get on board with organizations that can help with this, like um, First Draft News, for instance, or Witness, or even some of the journalism um, organizations. But it is very hard to fact check, you know. Uh, and by the way, YouTube is a big element in this too. Exactly. Yeah. So it's not just them. It's 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 all these different platforms where the the misinformation is spreading. And even Amazon, we're running a piece actually looking at. Uh, how basically Amazon, um, the, the book recommendations have led to a lot of spread of dis and misinformation because one book by one author who doesn't believe in the coronavirus then gets recommended by another non-believer. And then suddenly there's, it's a profit making like, you know, and, and of course that Amazon wants to take that off and they want to, to deal with this, but these algorithms, there's no way to really manage it properly. Um, so, so there needs to be a solution and I'm sure automation is part of it, but it has to be much more sophisticated than it is at the moment. Um, so what, did, what needs to happen? Journalists need to, um, get trained up in this. And one way they can do that is by taking, uh, by first of all, reading our, uh, verification handbook, which is on datajournalism.com written by Craig Silverman, who was at Buzzfeed for years now is at ProPublica. And he's like the, I'd say he's like. I don't want to say he's the god of disinformation and, and wiping that out, but he's very much an expert on that. There's other people that you can follow, Sam Gregory from Witness, Sam Dubberly from Amnesty International, who runs the Digital Verification Core. Um, and I actually, um, he worked with us on my other job at Advocacy Assembly on putting together a course on open source investigations for advocacy. Journalists can take this Lawyers can take this. I'm sure even data scientists can take this. It's a two-part course in four languages, and it looks at how you can develop these skills and tools online to fight and, and, and pinpoint um, mis- and disinformation. And it's specifically looking at more like war crimes and trying to verify what's happening with that. But it can be applied to other basic things, you know, any fake image, video, um, it can be applied to that. Of course, you're never going to get to the bottom of it, but you can. Uh, it's hard to ever prove that something is true. It's more you can't. You can prove that it's if something is fake, and because you can look at the metadata and see, oh, okay, this was altered in some way. Um, so yeah, so those are the resources I recommend because journalists have to have to upskill, and they and this is constantly changing. And one thing I would say is it's not about learning a tool; it's about the mindset, developing a mindset for for this and understanding um, the psychology behind it and and not be having so reliant on one tool. By the way, uh, I just thought of a, a couple of ways of attacking data journalism, which I will, I will uh, speculate here. So the first one is uh, you can create a website to make it convenient for data journalists to get data, but the data is all, <laughs> it's all fake. <laughs> You know, like world census dot data, right? So, uh, and then secondly, you can attack, you know, the data sources themselves, like World Bank and stuff. And I mean, how good is their cybersecurity, right? So, relative to relative to a uh, uh, determined uh, act, uh, bad actor, um, but uh, yeah. So, I you know the the two components are you know you have the fake media, fake data, but then the information propagation is really a tough one because that really depends on the platforms, right? So, um, And the I'm, size of those platforms is so huge that 
And how many algorithms times algorithms don't work? You don't have enough people. Yeah. And how many times have you have we seen, you know, if, even if a data piece of data is deemed to be fake, but maybe it was it was it wasn't detected until after an election, right? So and then the damage has already right. been done, right? So yep. um, yep. there's a temporal nature to the the whole information propagation as well. But uh yeah, so it seems like a, uh, just like any other area that involves security, someone determined and well funded can can do a lot I of. I don't have an answer for that. Can do a, can do a lot of can do a lot of damage. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, it just security basically. Didn't have an answer the, for that. Yeah, the technology is getting to the point where you can have a determined. I mean, like a nation state can do a lot of damage with some of these uh, natural language generation tools, right? So. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Um, I think we're seeing some deep fakes coming out, but it's not like because it's not necessarily there yet. Yeah. Um, uh, but it is. Yeah, and it's becoming. It, it could become a, a problem. Uh, but yeah, and digital security is really important for a lot of journalists, and and we encourage everyone to sort of. That's not our forte necessarily at datajournalism.com. Oh but yeah, we, you see, you folks might go out on the fi- in the field, right? Logging onto hotel networks. Oh, and, God. Oh, yeah. That's the that's the worst. Or like, yeah, on the plane or wherever. No, you have to be really careful. So uh, digital security, you know, is is key and two-factor authentication. And I think for data journalists, a lot of developers, I know they won't even put their photo up anywhere. They won't even go on a video like this. They're very careful. And I feel like it's because they know the power of what can be done, <laughs> you know. Um, but I think, they're, yeah, that, that digital security is really important. So we are um, coming up to a close here. I want to ask just uh, one last question. I'm really curious. So a lot has gone on the past year and a half. Um, what has surprised you? What What have you come across that has um, just been unexpected or uh, super significant or anything like that? I'd say the... <sighs> The, probably the one surprising thing over since COVID hit was how important data journalism actually became and how people were talking about interactives and wondering why certain data trackers weren't updated immediately or asking for certain articles to already have um, that data constantly being renewed and uploaded. Um, so I think the expectations from audiences, yeah, I'd say that people are becoming more data literate from this pandemic that includes journalists, but also the general public. So that I think was a surprise. Um, I didn't expect, I guess you could say. In the US that it's only a portion of the general public. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. <laughs> no, 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 perhaps, perhaps. Yeah, it's interesting that we just had a, there was a, a COVID map. I don't remember what outlet it ran in, but it was giving, um, vaccine percentages and i think i don't know if the source was the cdc but it was something big and there was maybe four states or five states in the middle of the country where it said no data available and my first thought was what (laughs) how is there no data available there's some data available but yes you start expecting things that uh, you never expected before it's it's fun and so many I thought of one more nefarious attack. I will oh no, I will put it out there, which is the sting operation. Right? So it wasn't there a bunch of conservative activists who would role play and and penetrate the uh, progressive groups and then they would kind of s- catch them in some sting operation. So you can imagine someone doing that with a data journalist at some point. I don't know if it's yeah. happened yet. Yeah. Or, what, or are, what, what are the safeguards? Video, or just faking their their video or their photo on something, and they haven't actually done it. That's another yeah. you know thing that we may see yeah. in the near future. I'm not encouraging that. I'm not welcoming that. But it, it is a, <laughs> an it opportunity. Is it is you, something you folks have to think through, right? So yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. And and here's the problem with journalism at the moment: we're not getting the investment that other um, industries are are getting. You know, we're, we're so. That outside, is problematic. Outside of the Washington Post. Yeah, yeah exactly. <laughs> <laughs> well, 
we're not getting, and they have an amazing large data team, by the way. But yeah, we don't, as an industry for innovation, we're not the pharmaceutical industry, right? So we need, we need investment in innovation, just like any other industry, especially if we're going to protect democracy and protect these Western values that we hope, you know, can, can be shared elsewhere in the world. Um, so it's, I, I see data journalism really a part of that and it's very important to be investing in that innovation. Actually, uh, one, one uh, closing question along those lines is, how, how, is the Europe, how is Europe different from the US? Because here definitely media is viewed as a business. There's NPR and PBS, but even they rely on corporate sponsors. Um, but someone told me, uh, some German friends told me there's no way something like a Fox News would happen in Germany for some, for some uh, law that they have there. But, uh, but generally, in Europe, is media also under the gun? To make I, money? Think, I think across the world, we're all struggling financially and the business models that are currently being deployed are not working. Uh, and, yeah. and unless we invest in independent reader-funded reader driven news that is where the readers are a part of a community um, that is the future and, and we're seeing a lot in eastern europe a lot of concerning things in eastern europe where um, a lot of oligarchs are buying up these papers particularly in places like uh czech republic where we didn't see that happening before and media freedom is uh is a concern and it's a very saturated market as well so this control from uh the elite uh, billionaires uh, is is a concern, and it does not help uh, the a healthy media sector, so to speak. So it depends on the country, but we're seeing a trend of things not being so healthy here, and a lot of um, journalists have had to, and, and media organizations have had to rely on funding from the Facebooks and the Googles just to get by. Um, you know, I, I subscribe to these national. Uh... On YouTube, I subscribe to these national networks like the BBC, RTE, DW. But B even BBC is kind of, I think, under the gun because basically uh, that model, Jen, would never fly here where everyone who buys a TV <laughs> has, has to pay something to the BBC. That's never going to fly here, right? Oh, um, no. Yeah, yeah. We have that in Ireland too. Yeah, and so then the licensing uh, fee. Yeah. yeah, yeah, that model even in those countries is under attack. Right? Oh so. yeah, definitely, and and they're all struggling for funding because uh, even though everyone is, there's been a push and, a, and an appreciation for these public broadcasters, they're losing a lot of advertising. So even though ever with their their readership and and their viewing numbers are like something that they haven't seen since the 1980s, some of these organizations, right? And but yet. They're, they're losing advertising and, and advertising is just not a sustainable model to pay for. It's, it's, it's lucrative, but it's unpredictable. And that's why that doesn't really work. And it's and also, it's also uh, uh, ends up uh, optimizing for clickbait. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah. Which we're, I think yeah. we're kind of moving away from, but yeah, uh, it's, yeah. yeah, it's still a problem. All right. This has been fascinating. Thank you Great so much, discussion. Tara. Yeah. Great. It was great to be here. Thank you so much for having me.